we're not going to waste any more time. We've been talking. Yeah, we should just let you get into your talk, and then you can just tell us everything that we want to know. Awesome. Um, so I'll let you go ahead and share your screen again. But everyone out there, welcome. This is technically the Hampton Roads on the users group. But I'm Kevin Griffin. My uh, friend to my uh, my left, your right is Drew Carpenter. Uh, helps with the group. Uh, and then our special guest tonight is right under, right under my face, Chris Woodruff or Woody to uh, all of his friends. Woody, it's so good to see you in person again. Yeah, you too, Kevin. I can't wait to actually see you in the flesh. So Absolutely. So hopefully Casey with the pending uh, yep. national disaster. I don't know. Yeah, I think Joe's going to be there too. So so we'll even see Joe there. So Well, dang, so, I should have booked out. Yeah, so today. if anyone has questions, please put them wherever... Kevin can get to him and he'll yep. interrupt me. Please interrupt me rudely if I'm if I don't have a break in my in my talking. Uh, I don't care if you just tell me to shut up and you have something that you want to talk to me about. So we'll I just that. shared my screen. All right, I'll add it. Okay. So, all right, Woody, the okay. floor is yours. Okay. Awesome. Well. Hey, I, I really appreciate this. This will be, technically, this is going to be my last virtual user group uh, talk that I'm going to do for this year. So uh, we don't know what next year, we don't know what the future holds for, for any of us, so, or for the world. So hopefully it becomes better. Uh, and 2022 brings lots of good stuff or the rest of 2021 brings some good stuff, but I'm gonna bring some good stuff in terms of Entity Framework Core 5. So uh, I love data. I love getting data into my applications. I love using data. Uh, and one of the things that I have uh, loved and hated over the past decade has been Entity Framework. Uh, it, as Kevin and I were saying, it has had a kind of a, a love-hate relationship, um, but I love the team. I love the people that have worked on Entity Framework Core over the last uh, 10, 11, 12 years. And uh, so I give them mad props. And so, uh, I think uh, we'll talk about that at the end where you can learn more about Entity Framework Core from the Microsoft side. So again, my, my name is Chris Woodruff. Let me flip over so I can do that. So, uh, so all that animation, uh, my name is Chris Woodruff. Uh, I work at Rocket Companies. Uh, so I put Rocket Companies because I'm kind of in a transition right now. So I, today I work at Rocket Mortgage, but as of this Monday, I will work at Rocket Homes. So uh, at Rocket Mortgage, I have been leading the developer relations team for the past more than a year. And I've been at Rocket Mortgage for almost two years. And there was an opportunity for me to, to get back into technology, back into doing, kind of getting my hands dirty and doing maybe some real technical work. So I'm going over to Rocket Homes to, to implement a uh, enterprise service bus for them. So it will be kind of fun. So that's why I put Rocket Companies because I'm kind of in, in kind of a flex right now. But you can email me at... Uh, Personal email is cwoodruff at live.com. My work email, and I forgot to change it. I have a new work email uh, right now. It's chriswoodruff at rocketmortgage.com, but the Quicken loans will still work. And on Twitter, you can find me at, at cwoodruff. So uh, it's kind of the different ways that you can find me. So, uh, yeah, that, that didn't really come across in, this, in the best 
the best way. But uh, hey, let's take a look at some things that I have talked about in the past. I've been doing talks around what's new in Entity Framework Core for two, maybe three or four years. And uh, so some of the past stuff that you should keep an eye out on, I'm not going to talk about them now because I've already talked about them in the past and we're going to talk about five today. And these are things from two and three. Uh, so there's like link, there's then I think in two, uh, the like function uh, was brought out, which corresponds to the SQL like uh, uh, part of your select statement. Global query uh, filters, awesome stuff. Uh, string interpolation and raw SQL methods. Love that. So look at that up. Probably my favorite thing that has ever come out in EF Core or uh, has been DB context pooling because I do uh, a lot of uh, APIs and web API projects. And DB context pooling should be used all the time when you're doing web APIs. So imagine uh, instead of every time you get a DB context out of your dependency injection uh, container, you it, and if you don't use pooling, uh, DI has to and .NET has to hydrate that that dependency in, or DB context every single time. So it has to create a new one, give it to you, get it back, put it in the garbage collection or dispose of it and let the GC take care of it, which which causes performance. So imagine you have a pool of DB context sitting inside DI and and you just get one and there is it's as easy as just calling it, you get it, and when it comes back, state stripped from it and it's put back in the pool. And so the only performance hit is at the beginning of the uh, application, which for a web application, and especially with a web API, your startup, uh, I don't care if I, it's a, another second to, to create all these DB context. If I can save tons of stuff uh, down the road, tons of uh, time down the road, not having to, to create those coming out of DI. So there's that. So do definitely take a look at DB context pooling. Uh, they added group by, which was needed for years. Uh, query tags. So query tags are cool because you can actually now send messages over to the SQL server. And this is more for SQL server. So you can send messages that get logged over in SQL server with your queries so if a DBA finds a query that they don't like or they can improve, you can put these messages into the log that tell the DBA, hey, maybe take a look at where this query came from. This query came from this project and this class and this method. So I use query tab tags to, to give my DBAs as much information about those queries so they can come back to me and say, hey, you have a really crappy query and it's in this method. And I can go, oh, well, let me fix it. And things get fixed a lot quicker. Uh, we can now, if you're a uh, DB first uh, user of EF Core like I am, I hate code first, I can reverse engineer all of my views so that those views come into my DB context and I can use them finally. Uh, and spatial, so spatial data, we can bring those in and, and use them in, in EF Core. Uh, keyless entity types, a view is a keyless entity type, uh, but you can also have tables that don't have a primary key to them and that can do. You can have uh, kind of ad hoc, ad hoc uh, uh, entities, and we'll look at those, how to do those today. Like if you want to create an entity from your database and you don't have that as a table, you don't have it as a view. Well, there is a way to, to do that now. 
and you can't update it and insert on it, but you can query on that ad hoc uh, entity. So we'll take a look at that today, but that stemmed from the keyless entity types. And I think that was uh, EF core 3.0. And then we have like single query statement per or single query, a SQL statement per uh, query, link query. So uh, that was another feature that I really liked. So, but let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. And these are all new features in EF Core 5. So the agenda is, and sorry, the, uh, the ordering came up, the animation was a little strange. I didn't check that. So, but uh, so we're going to talk about many to many. We're going to talk about split queries. We're going to talk about simple logging. It's really easy to log now for uh, for improved diagnostics. Uh, filtered include. That's an awesome feature that that uh, I've been waiting for many many years to get into EF Core. Flexible entity mapping. Uh, identity resolution, required one-on-one -on -one dependence, uh, this thing called the DB context factory. So if you're a fan of the factory pattern, we will give you some, some love. Uh, and then event counters. So event counters will help you see the performance or the non-performance in your, uh, in your, uh, uh, .NET application using EF Core. And then uh, have a way to uh, get into the pipeline for saved changes. So if you've ever wanted to, to see or do things that uh, as things are being saved from your application back to your, your data storage, your database, or wherever you store your data, there is now an interceptor for, for uh, save changes, and we'll take a look at that. So again, if you have questions, please uh, just ask. Kevin will interrupt me, and we will. Uh, uh, I will try to give you an answer. If I don't know, I'll just say I don't know, and I'll go look up the answer and figure out how to how to get it to you after after the meeting or sometime in the future. So let's move on. So many to many. So for a long time, EF, so Entity Framework back in the .NET Framework days and Entity Framework Core had a really hard time with a many to many relationship. And, and so uh, that has been worked out. So uh, it's interesting. There were lots of different ways that, that we had to handle that. Most of them with, was with lots of code, but we have a, a way to do it now. So, so imagine you have uh, two entities and these are the two entities. Uh, and there's another entity in this, in this DB context or in this app called blog. So a blog has posts and posts have tags, but also tags are associated with, because uh, posts have tags, tags can be associated with the posts. So we can have a post that has multiple tags and then tags have been associated or tagged onto blog posts. So you have this many to many relationship and uh, underneath the covers, so in your database, you probably have a post tag or a tag post table, like some kind of join table underneath that you would have to bring also into your application as another entity and, and uh, uh, behave and write lots of code to say, hey, I'm going to create a post. I'm going to attach tags to it. When I save this, I have to save it to the post and I'm going to have to save it to this post tag join table. 
and before so so there were there was a lot more code so uh there isn't as much code now it actually uh this allows you to to handle that and i'll show you some code so i so this is what uh it also looks like when we're building it in the on creating method of the uh of the db context so you'll see that we have a post and the post has many tags and we use uh we have this thing called use entity and this use entity will say because it has many tags i want you to use the post tag table to to keep the, that many the many relationship uh between a post and a tag and in the same way the tag has the same thing a tag has many posts and so we have this using entity to table for post tag so so uh right now this probably i you know off the top of my head for for a while, this was not being reverse engineered out of out of the database, so it wasn't being scaffolded. So if uh, it's not, you may have to go in, take a look at everything, and and write and and change the DB context to handle some of this. So, but uh, I'm hoping that in .NET six, it will it will be scaffolded correctly. And you don't have to uh, to do this by hand, but just know that you probably will have to to do this type of uh, uh, many to many join table. Uh, so, so if I jump out, let me jump out, and because I like to actually show some code, uh, I'm going to jump over. Woody, there was a question. Are you going to talk anything about mocking or or um using EF in like terms of testability? No. No. Okay. No, these are just new. Yeah. This is all new features. That's a whole all different right. talk. So so nope, we're we're gonna be just talking about new features that that I think everyone should look at in uh in any of the framework core. Sorry, testing. All right, we'll uh we'll find folks a resource for that. Yeah, find somebody to do testing. So uh I can Sean Killian is a good yep. is a good person to to probably to bring on about testing. He's shown me quite a bit in the past for that. So, but we're gonna come over here. Um, I'm gonna open up this blog. Uh, well, I'm gonna open up my program. So most of my programs in this are console programs, uh, and so they're not these big gigantic web applications they're just console apps that you can run and and all this code is available on github and i'll put the url at the end but um if i take a look at this and let's go up here oh so here's the on model creating you can see that i do have my my uh, blog so it's creating that that blog entity also. So a blog has many posts, but a post doesn't get associated back to a blog. So there's no many to many. It's just it's just uh, uh, I guess a, just a normal uh, join. But you can see that in here we have a post, and it does use that two table. And in my database, it does have this join table. And but you can you can see that I do not create an entity for that for that uh, that post tag table. It doesn't get represented as an entity in my in my DB context because truly a join table should be hidden behind the scenes and any of the framework kind of hides that and abstracts that that table away 
as a many the many relationship. So, so as you can see, I have a blog, I have a post, and I have a tag. That those are the only three entities I have uh, in this in this uh, uh, little application. So, that's the first feature. So, if you've ever wanted many the many, you have it now. Okay, so, uh, and I'm trying to get through all these in, in less than an hour because I respect all your times. Except for Joe's, I don't respect Joe's time. So, so I would take up the whole day for him if I, if I had to, so. Okay, split queries. So we know that there are some, there are some uh, queries, and you saw on the list of my my uh, past items that we that we talked about that in the past we had this this assumption that EF Core would do all of its work on the on the database server wherever that was. So in the past, Entity Framework did some of its work on the, on the database and did some of the work back in the application, like filters. So Entity Framework in the beginning, one of the things that people found alarming was that, and this was way back, so, so it, hasn't, it hasn't done this in a, in a while, it would if you did a uh, a filter in your in your link statement, it would bring back the whole data set and filter that at the in the application side. So they fixed a lot of that, and uh, in EF Core two or two point one, everything would be done on like on the other side so nothing no uh your link statements nothing in your link statement would be done in the client everything would be done over on the database side on the database server side and it would be done primarily in one select statement so ef core would build this, this single select statement and send it across a wire and get back the result set and you would get all of that, which is great. You know what, it really helped. I, I said it really shared the responsibility between the application and the database server. Well, they, they found that having everything as one select statement sometimes wasn't the best way to, to handle it. Like in this example, uh, this was what the select statement would be sending it across a wire to the other side. So here's, here's the, uh, what EF core, when you said, uh, execute this link statement, it would go across and send this select statement and bring it back. So this is kind of a simple one, but imagine a very complex link statement and trying to do that in one select statement. They got pretty, pretty big, pretty hairy, and sometimes they weren't very fast. So there's a new there's a new link sub call sub and to be honest I don't even know what what they like there's a new link feature called at split query so this is this is the ability to tell entity framework hey if you can make this link statement quicker by splitting it up in the multiple SQL statements going across the wire, do so. And what will happen with this is these two select statements will be created, sent across the wire, 
and brought back and put back together and you get a, a uh, result set back from, from uh, uh, any of the framework core. And by doing this, you may get better performance. So it's a feature. So if you know that uh, you have a very ugly, hairy link statement, you may just go, hey, Entity Framework Core, go do your thing. If you need to, to use multiple, split this up into multiple uh, queries, go ahead and do it. So that is a nice feature to have. Uh, I don't recommend putting this everywhere, uh, but if I, I would use this one, if uh, you know a query is going to be com uh, very complex. Two, if your DBA comes back and says that query that you just sent over, it's really complex. It, it's just taking a long time to perform. That might be a, a flag, a red flag to, to use as split query. So I'm not going to really show an example of this because we can kind of see it if I if I show you the two different ways, you're not gonna, for this example, you're not gonna see the difference, but just know that there is, there can be a performance issue or a performance increase if you, uh, if you do uh, identify some queries for a uh, split query. Okay, simple logging and improved diagnostics. So in the old days, meaning before Entity Framework Core 5, we would have to create a logging factory and create that and associate it with the, uh, uh, associate with the uh, 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 DB context and we would have to write code. And uh, you know what? Sometimes writing less code is kind of nice. So this is all that we have to do. Uh, on, on configuring, uh, if you just say as uh, for your DB context options builder, you can add an option that just says log to and you can say wherever that goes for, in this case, I'm sending it to the console and it's just gonna write a line. So every, everything that, that comes across the log uh, gets, gets sent to the console, but you could send it to another DB context to get, to get stored someplace. You can send it to text file, you could send it anywhere that you want to. So it's it's really simple to to do logging now. Uh, so I find this this really good. If nothing else, adding this to your to your uh, code uh, just to and and I don't I wouldn't do this for production. I would kind of not send it out to console for production, but but if you're testing something, it's easy to add this log to and, and see what's going on uh, in the console, in the, in the uh, uh, debug console. So it's kind of a nice feature. Again, I mean, I could, well, you know what? Since I didn't show a demo last time, I will show show what this looks like so so let me so i'm going to run this like i said this just shows up in the console and you can see all these debug so this just gets all the artists from and i use a database called chinook uh which is a microsoft uh test kind of demo database. Um, and I kind of picked the ball up because they were gonna actually get rid of it. And I pulled it, all the stuff, and it's sitting out in one of my repos. Um, 
because it used to live on Kevin, what was the name of the open source project that uh, Microsoft had years ago that Sarah led? Like pre GitHub, where, op where open source projects would be. Codeplex. Code Codeplex, yes. Yep. So Chinook lived on Codeplex. And I had a strange feeling when Codeplex was going to be taken down that Chinook would go down with it. And it actually did. So I grabbed all the stuff and and threw it out into a repo. So uh, if you got to my, uh, out to C Woodruff is my GitHub username. If you got to my uh, repos, there should be a, a Chinook database repo that has all the, all the, uh, uh, code for it. But this is a fun database. It's kind of a music online music store. So it has instead of bicycle parts and widgets, it has actually albums and rock and jazz and all these different music genres that I love, like Led Zeppelin. Like what other da database has Led Zeppelin as its test database or test data? So it's awesome. So, but you can see up here all these debug statements. And this is what is being logged, all these debug statements. So you can so you can see all these and and log them out to someplace. If you're doing some kind of audit, some kind of audit uh, or wanted to store everything about your applications for later use for uh, performance uh, forensics, hey, Here's a great log feature. So, okay. So, so we have simple logging. So I'm going to go back to my project or to my presentation. What's the next thing we're going to look at? Filtered include. So we have the ability to filter when you do a where clause or a where statement in your in your link statement, but We've never had the ability to filter on the included associate, associated entities. So now we do. So now I can say, you know what? Give me all the artists. Give me every single artist, but only bring back the albums that are associated to those artists that contain the, the, the word the in the title of the album. And in this case, I also say like split, split query because I know that doing an include, sometimes it can, be, it can be an improvement to allow a split query. So that's why I have as split query. So if I run this and I'll show you the code for this, and I don't think there's any other code. Yeah, so we'll take a look at the demo. And so filtered include. So in here, I have the same code that I have in, I had in my presentation. So I'm gonna get I'm gonna get all the artists and I'm going to include albums where the title contains the word the. And then I'm just gonna bring back those those albums and then the count of the associated albums that come with it. So let me run this. Okay, so you can see it found all these albums, but for most of them, it's gonna have a zero because they don't have albums that have the word the in them. But uh, like this one does, Gus Gustav Mailer. Uh, let's see if we see any London London Symphony Orchestra in Sir Charles uh, Macaris. So that has one album that has the. Uh, let me see Temple of the Dog. So Temple of the Dog had the album name was. Temple of the Dog, and it had the in it, so it comes back as 
one. So, so the nice thing about these, these uh, filtered includes is that in the past, you may have had to do some extra coding when they were coming out to, to search all the associated uh, entity collections, but now you don't. You can actually have the database do all that work for you. So that's a nice feature. Any questions, Kevin? No questions so far? No, nope, pretty quiet. No, pretty quiet. Oh, I'm boring everyone. Okay. Yeah. Or they're so engaged. They're that so, they well, yes, that's a better way. Of, a question. That's a better way of saying it. They're very engaged. They're learning a lot. So, okay. So flexible entity mapping. So this is kind of a cool, cool new feature. And I kind of alluded to it in the beginning, but let's dig into it. So say kind of two, two initial things. So say you had an entity that wasn't represented by a table. And let's say that you didn't have control of your database. So it was in control of a, a team of DBAs. And they're good guys, the DBAs, but they don't want to add a view to it just for you. That they're like, no, you know what? We're not we're not going to add views. We're 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 against views. Well, how could you get a entity that's not a table, but still use it in your in your uh, application. Well, you can do flexible entity mapping. So you can give it as an example. The the first one is I'm giving it a uh, uh, interpol interpolation string, and I'm giving it a select statement. And I'm going to associate that to a entity that I have in my in my application domain. So in this case, I'm just representing an album. But if you can see, I'm also in, including the artist name. So uh, in my database, the album table has an ID. It has uh, a title. It has an, an artist ID to it. But who wants to, to get an album, some album information, if you don't have the artist name coming back also? It's kind of, you, you always want to know who created that album. So in this case, I can add that name, artist name, to the uh, uh, to my album entity, and it will bring that in. So it's kind of cool. So so you could actually use this for domain driven development also. So the interesting thing is you can you can create all these ad hoc entities from your from your database, bring them in now you're not going to be able to insert against them or or update against them or do any delete but but you could write your own code to to do any of those behind the scenes but uh so it's kind of an interesting way to give you some flexibility that you may not have had in the past to bring some some ad hoc uh entity types into your application. And also you can you can uh, bring in functions now and you can associate a function to a, to an entity type. So um, so I just threw out this example. So get albums from artists. So this function takes an artist ID and it it returns from this function the albums that uh, that are in there, but you could do it as like a calculated value. So maybe you do a function in here called uh, 
state tax or country uh, VAR or some kind of calculation that, that you do in a function and you can bring that back inside of a entity and you can work with it in your entity framework uh, uh, code. So, but we can also do something like this. We can say that we have an entity called album and it's associated to a table of that same name. So there's a table in the database called album and everything other than that, uh, everything else is the same except for one line in here. So that two view, what that's saying is if you have a two view and you give a view name, so that album with artist name, it will, when it queries against, when you build a link statement uh, targeting album, if you have that two view, it will not uh, uh, build a select statement against the album table it will actually build a select statement against the view and everything else will be done against the album table. So uh, inserts, updates, and deletes will all be done against the album table. So this is really cool because it gives you the flexibility to have kind of some some uh, extra features that you can bring, some maybe some some added added uh, properties that you want to bring over from your database into an entity, but still be able to to do all the other CRUD stuff. So the C and the uh, uh, the U and the D. So so, but I find this is really cool, and, and we'll even take a look at a demo of it. Okay, so let's take a look at some code. Uh, let's do that, let's get rid of that. So let's go down and we will do flexible entity mapping. So again, this one is using Chinook, a Chinook uh, DB context. So again, in here, so in my on model creating, I have album and I have this two view. If I take a look at the program that I'm running, I'm just going to go get all my albums. I'm going to loop through those albums and I'm going to uh, push out to the console on each line. I'm going to push out the album name, uh, dash, and then the uh, the name. So it brought back a name, which is the artist name. So, so in this case, Entity Framework has a title, which is the title of the album, and it has a name, which is the name of the artist that's coming uh, from a different table through a view. So let's run this. So you can see that there's all of our albums. So let's go up and see some interact. Okay, so there is Jimi Hendrix. So so uh, are you experienced? And artist is Jimi Hendrix. Uh, so they're surfing with the Alien, the remastered version, and that was a Joe Satriani album. So that was a great album that I loved when I was younger. Uh, Grace Tits by Lenny Kravitz. So, so this has some interesting data. I love this data. So it has kind of every, everything for everyone. For the metal heads, it has Iron Maiden and for lots of Iron Maiden. Uh, but for people like me, it has Foo Fighters and little Frank Sinatra and Faith No More it has a little bit of everything in it. So. So that's why I love using it. Um, okay, so so we saw that we can create ad hoc entities, 
coming back from select statements, we saw that we can map functions to to entities now, and we can we can uh, kind of enhance our current uh, entities through the use of views. So very cool stuff that uh, that the entity framework team has been doing. Uh, and somehow I lost my, there we go. Okay, so identity resolution. So this is not, this is not identity as in a user identity. This is entity as in identity for databases. So think of it as identity, meaning the primary key value for uh, a column in a database table, and then how that corresponds to to the uh, uh, uniqueness of a entity in the in EF Core. So I don't know if you knew this, but there was a uh, link statement called as no tracking, and as no tracking could be used uh, when you were building your queries so that it told Entity Framework that you didn't care about uh, tracking any changes inside, the, uh, inside those entities. So what I mean by this is uh, Entity Framework allows you to bring back a query and all the data back to it. You can, if you don't have as no tracking, you can modify those those entities, those objects, because they are kind of entity objects in your application. You can modify those, and those will be stored in the data in local memory until you say save changes on that entity through the DB context. And at that point, Entity Framework will take all of the changes for that, for all of the entities that it has and push out those changes out to the database and, and push them out and they should all go into the database. Not always, but they, most times they will, unless you have some kind of, someone else from some, some other application changed some data and there was a integrity uh, issue. Uh, but if you did no as no tracking, just as no tracking by itself, you were telling Entity Framework, don't track changes to any, any of the uh, entity objects that, that you're pulling back in this link statement. And the reason why they had that was for people like me who build APIs and I don't change anything. I basically just get data and turn it into JSON and push that JSON out through an HTTP response. So I don't need all the overhead for tracking all those changes in those entity objects. One caveat with using as no tracking is that uh, it also turns off identity resolution. So if you do want, some people do want to be able to modify those objects, those entity objects and save them back to the, to the uh, or use them or do something with them. Identity resolution is turned off if you use as no tracking. So they added this new link statement that says add no tracking with identity resolution. So uh, what will happen is if you try to do something, and I'll show an example in a second, if you try to do something and you're trying to store like maybe a new object that uh, 
that is trying to that already has a identity that exists in the database it won't it won't let it happen so let's take a look at this code example it, it's a little easier to look at in the code so again shut this down turn this off and we will identity resolution so in here i have chinook db context the chinook database that i've been using a lot today and i'm going to grab an album so we're going to call it album a and it's just an id of one so if i grab this album i have it it's from the database i'm saying don't track use the as no tracking with identity resolution so i'm saying don't track any of the changes i don't care about changes that you do to it don't don't keep track of those changes if i do anything with album a but i want to keep i want to make sure that uh that no one messes around with with uh uh with that that uh id so i also have this album b which is a new album it's a new object and i give it id one and i give it some title london calling it's actually my favorite album of all time so so it's by the clash so london calling i give that as a title down here i say update album b I could say insert uh, or I could say update. I'm just going to say update. If I have, if I don't have this statement, it will throw an exception. So this exception will get thrown. So that's the interesting thing. If I, if I had something like, if I had something like this, so if I just said, give me A, create B, and I try to update B, which by doing an update, if it's a new object, it will actually insert it. Uh, that will throw an exception, and that exception will, will get handled someplace. In this case, in inside there is a console write line. Interesting, if you do as no tracking with identity resolution and you do the same call it doesn't even throw an exception it just doesn't let it happen it will actually go through that and go on and like nothing nothing happened it won't tell you that it it didn't do it but it won't do it so just remember i've just given you a little little insight into this it will not throw an exception. It will just skip over and go, nope, I'm not worrying about, I'm not letting this go out to the database because I have identity resolution turned on. But I don't have tr uh, tracking, uh, entity tracking turned on. Okay, so if you have questions about that, you can ask, but but it's an interesting feature that uh, I probably will be for up to now. I have used uh, as no tracking in my APIs for all my queries. I think I'm going to do as no tracking with identity resolution from now on. So I'll be going through some of my API projects and, and updating those queries. Because I think that's a that is a very good, especially for API people, that's good just to make sure that you're not doing something inside your API that will that will mess up your data. Okay, so required one-on-one -on -one dependence. This is interesting. So this is a way for us to say, hey, an album has one artist and only one artist. So I want, uh, entity framework to to keep that to adhere to that that rule and and you can see down here uh, in the last 
last part of this uh, model builder for, for album, you can see that entity dot has one. And what this is saying is there's only one artist that can be associated to an album. Now that's pretty obvious because we have, we only have a artist ID. There's an artist ID for one artist ID for each album. So, so it's kind of a, you're stating the obvious. So you're, so this is actually a Mr. A Captain obvious type of, type of piece of code. But if you, uh, you can have something that says like has one where maybe your database is set up to allow many, but you want to say there's only one, you can actually put that in your DB context uh, and entity framework will adhere to that rule and allow only one uh, of a associated entity to be to be kind of brought into into its uh, uh, model, so to say. So, uh, not going to show a code example for that. So, uh, DB context factory. So, I'm also not going to show uh, uh, a uh, uh, demo for this because. To be honest, I, I didn't create one because it was a little more advanced. Uh, so this is instead of, I think I can explain it also. So instead of uh, when, in this case, a controller needs a uh, DB context to come out of the, uh, come out of the, uh, Dependency injection container, you can actually have a factory uh, be eject, injected in and to be able to be used. So some people, instead of just maybe getting at the uh, the constructor level of, of your uh, controller, um, like in most of my controllers up till now, I would go out to, the, uh, in the constructor, I would grab that DB context and associated to a private property in my in my uh, uh, controller class. But in this case, I could, if I wanted to do a, a, a DB context factory, if you like the factory pattern, you can now add a DB context factory to your dependency injection container and get that out so that uh, you could do uh, use use the factory pattern in your in your code. So I thought it was interesting. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to use this very much, but there there could be cases that that I use this. So I just kind of want to explain. And you can even do like we have that DB context pooling. You can do DB context factory pooling. And have a pool, pool in the Pensy injection container of these DB context factory factories, so that uh, they don't have to be hydrated and created every time you want to get one out of your out of DI. So that's also uh, a feature. So event counters. So event counters are not part of your code. They're actually kind of outside your code and I'll show you. So there's these, these .NET tools that you can install. And one is called uh, .NET Trace and another one's called .NET Counters. And I use both of them in this demo. If you don't know very much about them, they are really interesting. They're really cool to, to kind of monitor your, uh, where the, .NET counters are really cool to uh, to monitor your application if you just want to see what's going on. So you install both of these uh, through with the global uh, indicator. So you install them globally. And uh, let me run 
let me run an application. So give me a second while I stand up uh, another instance of my IDE. Any questions out there, Kevin? Uh, we've been having a discussion in chat about code first versus database first. Oh. So, so oh. I don't know if you want to chime in on that or if you want to wait till you're all done. I don't know, man. I don't want to start a fight. So, no uh, fight. We've been having a lovely conversation about it. To be honest, I, uh, I hate code first migrations. I hate them because people don't know how to write a DB context well enough to have a well tuned database. Yep. If, if you know all the nuances so you can create all your, your indexes and create everything that goes into a database, Hey, more power to you. But here is, and let me see where this, oh, there it is. So I would, to be honest, if someone is a fan of code first, I would give them this argument. If a database developer or a DBA walked up to you and said, eh, I don't need, I don't need you to write me an application. I've got a tool that all I have to do is run it against my against my database and it gives me an application and that's all I need. Mm -hmm. Kevin, how, what would you do if if a de, if a DBA told you that? So say that one more time if a DBA what? So if a DBA if you said, "Hey, you know what? I see you have that nice database." Yep. Do you want me to create an application for you that that will hit that database? for an end user and they said, no, it's okay. I'll just, I've got a tool that, that will, uh, that will create an application. I just run it against my, my database. It creates an application and I'm all good. Yeah. I'm, if the DBA says that to me, I'm, I'm probably going to be like, all right, well, I'll talk to you next week. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so what, why is it why is it okay for a developer to tell to basically DBA, tell yep. DBA the same thing? Absolutely. Okay, so so think about that. Yep. I'm not saying that that there aren't cases for code first and migrations, but you have to be you have to know really what you're doing because I have not found a database that a person has created using code first and migrations that did not have major issues in the database. Yeah. That, that you may be able to run queries against that database. You may be able to get dat data and do all your CRUD calls to it, but that database is not going to be tuned to give you maximum performance. Yeah. Like when we're writing code, we're more likely to split. Uh, so basically, if you're translating a table to a class, when I'm building classes, I'm more likely to split a class into multiple classes or subclasses. And when, I, But when I'm building a database, I'm less likely to do multiple tables for content. I might, I might not, you know, what uh, was it, normalize. I might not normalize a database. It's like, well, this... If I have a, a user table, a user table might only need one address in it. But if I'm writing code, I might have an address, um, uh, uh, what's the term, um, subclass on a user. And I'm thinking if I'm writing that in code first, it might default to having a user and an address table and then doing the join uh, between them. Yeah, so having it, a many to many. Yeah, yeah, it's easier to build less performing code in EF. Um, yeah. Now, if we're because, talking and we're talking reads, like we're talking writes, it's hard to screw up a write performance wise. Sure. Sure. Write, I'm not reading. saying, but but how many 
how many reads do you have compared to a right? Oh, like or a magnitude more. Yes. Yeah. And and that's a thing. And there are ways to in your in your uh creating your DB context or creating your code first, adding annotations and stuff that will tell any framework core to create indexes in your in the generated database. Yeah. But you know what? Show me a developer, a .NET C sharp developer that actually knows how to do that. They're they're few and far between. I understand the concepts. It's more of the I don't have the 20 years experience doing that. Exactly. Necessary. Yeah. And and so that is also what I talk about in my talk that you know if you do write these databases and they get generated from your thing you you have to doubly have to understand your the tools the uh the profiling tools that you have for those database servers like SQL Server. So you can go in and, and take a look at the query store and mm -hmm. all of the stuff to see, because they will tell you if you're missing indexes and stuff like, I mean, SQL Server is very advanced and it will tell you this query needs an index. And it will even tell you the, the SQL statement to run to add that index to your to your database so so if you know so if you use code first with migrations and you know how to dig into your sql server to take a look at all the queries that you're generating to see if there's any any missing indexes hey then i'm okay maybe with that code first but for 90 percent of all people that do code first migrations yep nothing good comes comes from it uh so that's my yeah. that's my soapbox i'll die in that hill arguing that and i i think it was i i uh, no, okay that's enough i don't want people hating me so no so hate you. they well <laughs> if i if i uh keep talking like this they're gonna hate me okay so uh I am going to, I, I just opened up a web API project and I'm going to, can you see that on my screen? Yes, you can. So, yep. so this is just a web API and I have a swagger. So like, I'm, I'm just going to go grab some, some data from this. So it just grabs some data and it uses that same database Chinook. So, so I have this now, if I run this, if I bring up a console and, uh, and I'm sorry, but I need to, and over here, I'm going to say .NET trace PS. So what .NET trace PS does is it will and let me get back my console it will allow me to see all of the dotnet applications that are running on my on this machine so i can just say dotnet trace ps so right now uh there's a couple but i'm only worried about this chinook api and I'm really just worried about the uh, uh, the PID, the the process ID. So uh, because what I also want to write run, I'm going to move this down. Is I'm going to want to see really what I want to see is this this .NET uh, counters. So I can say .NET counters monitor. I'm sorry if I'm if I'm uh, typing all this out. Uh, hopefully I am uh, writing all this correctly so I don't have a a mistake. And I say dash p. And what is my PID? I think it's the one one nine 
five one six. So hopefully I didn't and I did type something. Did you wrong. control plus on that once or twice to make it easier yes. to see? Hmm. It's not a monitor. It's it's oh not a okay. So it's, yeah, sorry. I uh, I am here. Let me let me uh, properties. Fun. I should be using the uh, the uh, uh, there. Yeah, that's, that's I good. should be using yeah. the Microsoft uh, terminal. So uh, so let me change that. So dot net counters monitor Microsoft dot entity framework core. Okay. Shoot. Oh, yeah. oh, fat fingers. Sorry, I have to type this all over again. So, so how many people like code first and how many people do not like code first? I think I can do a poll. Hold on. We could do a poll. I can do a poll. Well, well, if folks watching on Twitch, I can do a poll. Maybe. Oh crap! There's a lot of stuff in here. So uh, you you do a poll, and I'll show this demo. All right. Okay. So so what happens when you run when you run this uh, this counter? You get this real time. Uh, console application that uh, gives you all this information. One is it gives you all the system runtime information, which is really interesting because it will tell you like your CPU usage and and all your information about your garbage collector and even all the different generations. I mean, most .NET developers don't even understand that there's multiple generations inside your garbage collector. So, but this is interesting, but by, by giving it that uh, Microsoft Entity Framework Core, you're adding to some of the, uh, uh, some of the counters. So down here, you, you get all of your like active DB contacts. So you can see how many DB contacts are currently created and and hydrated and running in your application. So right now I only have one. Uh, it'll tell you how many executions failed, uh, optimistic concurrency failures, which are uh, uh, those are things that are given back to the database. So how many failures uh, for putting data into your database? I'm 90% that that is correct. Uh, how many queries? How many queries per second? How many queries total? Query cache hit, uh, save changes. So you can see how many times you've, you've, uh, you've modified or done any changes to those entity objects and stuff like that. So. So this is actually really interesting uh, and it's really valuable for you as a developer to, to have this at your, at your fingertips. Um, so use those, those counters uh, that you have for in, inside .NET. So, so I will kill this or I will say, yep, I can just kill it. Okay, so that is event counters, and I showed the demo. So save changes interception for auditing. This is the last one, and this is something where if uh, you wanted to intercept the and take a look at what's going through the save changes, you can now catch certain events inside that pipeline and do stuff with it. So you have to build your, your uh, interceptor and I'll show you kind of 
I'll show the code on how to do that. I won't write it, but uh, I do have the example out in this uh, repo. But uh, it uses, it. you have to write an interceptor that uh, adheres to the I save changes interceptor uh, interface. And what you get is you get three types of, really you get three types of events. They're, they're a synchronous and an asynchronous version. So one is save changes. So when something gets called save changes, it'll give you that uh, event data and uh, you can do stuff with it. Uh, there's an async version of that. When you save, after you save the changes, you can grab onto that event and do something in there. Or if a failure happens on the save changes, you can grab that event and do something in there. So in this case, in this code uh, case that I have for this temp demo, I'm just basically, I'm just gonna log all this stuff into another database for auditing purposes. So let's take a look at that demo. So let me grab the right code. Oh, missed it. So, so let me get rid of this. Uh, let me go up into, where is that? Okay, save changes, interceptor. So, um, in here, I just have a uh, few things. I'm going to create a new blog. I'm going to save that asynchronously. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, create another blog. And then I'm going to, to remove it. I'm, I'm going to do a bunch of things in here. And I'm going to then take a look and I have this interceptor that will allow me to grab onto all these events uh, that are happening in my, in my uh, uh, application using Entity Framework Core. So let's take a look at the blog context because this is the first thing that I need to do. So in here, I have, uh, I have my on configuration. So I'm going to set up my DB context, configure it just like I normally do, but I'm going to add an interceptor in here. And this interceptor is underscore auditing interceptor. And where I get this is from, uh, I grab the, well, I grab it from here. So. So I, uh, I could get it from uh, dependency injection, but I didn't in this demo. I just am creating a new auditing interceptor and I am going to uh, uh, add that to this private read-only property. So let's take a look at one, this auditing context. So I actually have a separate database, a separate DB context that I am saving saving uh, either uh, uh, some information. So I'm doing a save uh, changes audit, I'm doing it or I'm doing an entity audit. And these are just storing different information. So, so in the, in the uh, entity audit, I'm just giving the ID, uh, I'm gonna give the state, the audit message and uh, and then this is a save all changes audit uh, uh, property of, uh, of some type. But mostly I, I want this save changes audit, which is an ID, gives me the audit ID, start time, end time, succeed, if it succeeded or not, the save change. And then if it did have an error message, I can get an error message. And then it will give me a list of all of the, for that save changes, it will give me a list of all the entities that that occurred in that save changes 
uh, call. Because when you, like I said, when you do a uh, save changes on an entity type, you may have n number of, of uh, entities that you've modified. So, so in here, so uh, we have that DB context. So in here, what I have is uh, this interceptor will get a connection string. It'll have a connection string in here and it will use that uh, audit DB context throughout the uh, the code. So like I say, I have a, I'm just, I have one for each of uh, async and synchronous. So I have save changes async, save changes. Um, and I'm, I just did this because I wanted to show all the different ways that you can do it. And then I have uh, saved and saved uh, async. And all this really does is it will give me, so let's just say, uh, let's take a look at save, saving changes. So saving is what happens the first event that gets fired. And so I get that event data. I can create on that event data context, I can create a new audit. And basically I'm just gonna add that audit to the DB context for audit and then it, it will save that out to uh, the audit uh, database. And again, if I do a, uh, uh, like for this one, if I get failed, uh, I will say succeeded is false. End time is some uh, UTC now date time. And then I get the error message coming back from that event uh, data. So really all, all this code is doing is, is allowing you to, to get into, and this is the code to create the audit itself. So when we did that create audit, this just kind of created all the, uh, the information. So uh, it will give you kind of the state depending on, uh, that context coming in, so it will know if, if it was a if the state was deleted, modified, or added. So you can do different things based on based on the state of whatever the state save changes coming through that that pipeline. But what I wanted to really show was you now have the ability to to tie into that pipeline for save changes, just like you have the ability, other pipelines, such as like the HTTP pipeline, like the ability to, to get into things before they get routed over to, to a controller action, you can actually get in into that middleware. So think of this interceptor as the entity framework core middleware uh, that you can get and tie into and do stuff based on it. So uh, you can't really modify, you can't really like modify things in here. You're just reacting and allowed to, to see the data that's coming through. You can't modify it before it goes on in the pipeline. So, so that is kind of one thing that you can't do with these interceptors. There is a good question about okay. the interceptors. Um, is, is there any sort of performance hit using these? Well, sure, sure. I mean, yeah, you're always going to to get some performance if you if you have these uh, in here. So would I you're gonna have to take a look to see one if if having this type of audit is is worth the small performance hit now now i mean these are a few lines of code but you're talking these are going to run if you have them set up for each each one of those different stages through the uh, save changes pipeline you're going to get three three calls that you normally wouldn't uh 
get if you were just doing a uh, a uh, uh, save uh, save changes without the interceptor. So yes, there is going to be some kind of performance hit, but you just have to weigh that out with with the benefit of of what you get from from allowing that for that audit purposes. We had a project. We were doing something similar, not exactly what you were doing, um, but we were looking at the change tracker, and we were uh, we had a link query to say, are there any uh, entities of a certain type? And so, real quick, look at the change tracker, see if there was anything we actually cared about. If there was, we would go do our performance hitting work. Uh, but if there wasn't, in most cases there wasn't, we would just continue to go about our business. Um, yeah, and I actually I have something like that uh, in for a web API project. It's not in save changes. It's actually in the middleware in the HTTP middleware mm -hmm. where I check to see when a HTTP request is coming in. I check to see in the body if uh, if it's a if it's a uh, update or a put. Yeah. If it's a put verb, I check to see if an ID has been is part of the the payload coming in. If there's no ID, I just shoot it back as as an error. So it doesn't oh, even yeah, come yeah. in. It doesn't even come into my. Uh, into my uh, uh, action controller actions because I do the same thing with delete. If yeah. an ID isn't, if there's no ID with the delete verb, why why have it continue yeah. on? I just shoot it back as a it's as like a four hundred error. Fail fast. Yeah. Yeah. But so I know I'm I'm probably way over my time I, I sometimes ramble and, and go on but I just wanted to uh, give some resources so uh, if you do want to know more about EF core the documentation is excellent uh, most of the uh, new documentation that Microsoft has for many much of .NET uh, and all of the the other frameworks and and libraries are really good so you can just go out to the ef core documentation uh follow ef core team their their twitter name is ef magic unicorns so i love that name uh then you can go out on github uh and one other thing that that i that they have is they have a uh, stand up meetings on on uh youtube that they do once a month and those are really good uh so if you're a big you like to watch the teams do their stand-up like i love like today they had the asp dot yeah dot team do stand up and they were talking about the minimal api web api stuff and that was really interesting but the ef core team does stand-ups also and they they record them and you can find them out on YouTube. But if you want the code for all of these demos that I showed you, you can just go out to my GitHub account, which is C Woodruff, and the repo is EF Core 5 demos. Nothing, it, you should be able to find that pretty easy. But if you want any of the previous talks, so I do have an EF Core. I think I have EF Core 3 demos. I don't think I have an EF Core 2 demos, but uh, but 3 is kind of a, my 3 talk was kind of a mashup of 2 and 3. So that one has a lot of demos for a lot of that stuff that I talked about in the beginning uh, from past talks. And that's it. That's that's my That's my talk. So hopefully someone got something out of that that they can go back and and use tomorrow at work well folks if you have any questions drop them in the chat now um so uh woody the results of our poll 
um, favor database first. Yes. Over Thank code you. first. Um, Thank you. You, you just, you just gave me inspiration for humanity and, yep. and our developer community. So. I remember what was it EF1 EF1 when we had it was only database first and you used to have to update your model it was really uh, easy you just right click the model yeah never oh and did you ever try to to go into the actual contents of an EDMX file and try to muck around with yeah. that tried is the word. try yeah. yeah it was so easy to mess to mess up so it's like, oh crap, I broke it. And yeah. before I was real heavy into Git, I think we were using like sore, uh, we were using Vault or Perforce and yeah. trying to undo changes. Oh, it was a pain in the butt. Yeah, that, yep. with that, you just basically have to regenerate that EDMX <laughs> yeah. all over again. So, so good time. Well, hopefully, I didn't tease Joe too much. Well, uh, Joe uh, hasn't shown his face since we teased him. So oh, maybe... I'm sorry. I'll, I'll have to uh, apologize to him. But we give each other crap all the time. So so we actually work together. Joe Joe works at, at Rocket Mortgage. He's a great guy. All right. People just saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, I can see the comments. So I appreciate everyone. I really love this, this talk. Uh, so it's it kind of it's fun to do. It's even more fun when I'm in front of people, but uh, and I hope soon we will get in front of people. And you know, I promised Drew and Kevin that that in a couple of years, maybe next year, 2023, I'll actually come to uh, Virginia to. Uh, We'd love to have you. people. Yeah. yeah. So. When we're allowed to meet in person again, I think we're we were allowed to meet in person, but I don't know if that's changed any. We haven't had that discussion. Yeah, uh, we'll, see, we'll wait another year just to see how the well, at least wait. Sells. I don't. Know. <laughs> now I'm just back to see knowing that everyone was in favor of database first brought me up, but now we're talking about this and no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So it's uh, okay. Well, I just have a feeling part? that we're gonna have another surge. Winter's gonna come. I just, I mean, I'm not being political. I'm just saying, get vaccinated. Wear your mask. Uh, get, get the shot. And yep. in a few weeks, the Pfizer, the Pfizer uh, vaccine will be will be approved, and hopefully, people will get vaccinated so that's just coming from a concerned person yeah. so so different topic you had mentioned uh, the asp.net stand up earlier i watched a good part of that too um as a you do a lot of api talks what do you think about minimal apis in terms of because i have an opinion i'm mixed yeah I'm mixed. i i i want to see a, my thing is I decouple everything. Yeah. And I want to see how how I can decouple things. And you know what? The demos that Microsoft does, they what they the demos that they do, they have to keep them relatively simple. Yes. To explain things. And like I say in many of my talks, like web APIs, like your controller actions should do nothing but call something to get information and send it back. That's all it should do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I mean, now, now I think they're interesting. Now I do see one place that I, I could see this minimal API working out really well is in uh, Azure functions and uh aws lambdas i think that is that may be where where they just will just kick ass yeah i was thinking the same thing uh it's at least the, every demo i've seen a minimal apis reminds me of a 
a intro level demo to Node.js and Express. And I think that's the level of introduction they're trying to hit is, look, I can write an API, quote API, in 10 lines of code with no ceremony. I just write functional code. Um, but as soon as you get past that, you've now hit this point where it's like, oh, crap. Now yeah, I need complexity. a layer of complexity. Yeah. Yeah, the complexity uh, work. turns on, yeah. And and you know what? Uh, if I'm just writing one little endpoint to do, like, to do uh, a the four verbs yep. for one thing. Like Azure Functions, you would. Yeah, Azure Function and just have, have a bunch of Azure Functions working in a micro in a uh, micro uh, API type of environment. Yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot the micro, my, my, my brain is turning off. It's almost eight o'clock. No, you're what's fine. The, what's the architecture idea, the micro services? I'm sorry. Yeah. My, yeah. You just, you could create a bunch of micro services for instead of having to stand all of them up just and have them sitting there listening you just create each one as a with a minimal api sitting either in in your azure function or your aws lambda and i i really like that idea um it, it feels like a good mix between minimal like the demo we saw earlier today and full blown out controllers um mm -hmm. so Always the thing I hate about just traditional API development in in .NET is like, all right, I need another controller. Let me set everything up. Okay, um, our friend uh, Steve Smith um, has another interesting approach with uh, API endpoints. Yeah, um, yeah, I like I like the endpoint idea. So it's Steve. Steve is on to something. Yeah, um, but we'll see. I mean. I, I do want to take a look. I want to try out the minimal API with with those two with those two uh, cloud features. Yeah. Because one, they're cheap too. I mean, Azure Functions and and AWS Lambdas are they're really cheap yeah. to to use. So, well, speaking of Azure Functions, uh, our talk next month is actually Azure Functions and Azure API Management oh. uh, with uh, Mr. Brian Gorman um, cool. going to join us. So if, uh, if you haven't already, go to hrnug.org and join our meetup so you get notifications for that stuff. Uh, Surly Dev, what's uh, our Dallas's approach? Uh, so he has this concept called API endpoints, which so tr traditionally web API is controller based. So like it's like MVC. Yeah, it's, it's a, MVC, but you're not returning HTML, you're returning uh, JSON or XML or whatever the the client um, negotiates, and you <laughs> um, with endpoints, you're basically you're getting to the to the meat of it. Given an endpoint, uh, a verb and an endpoint, do something, and add in your layer of validation and all the stuff you need. But you don't need the ceremony of a uh, controller every time you want to do that. Um, so Steve Steve's on to a, a good workflow, and I've, yeah. I've been meaning to do some demo work with it um, because I I might have a couple of cases I want to pull it in. So it's yeah. another thought no, process for you guys. Steve's a smart guy. I like yeah. I like talking to Steve. So he always makes me feel dumb though, which is good. I like I like being the dumbest. And here's my advice to everyone on this on this meeting. Always be the dumbest person in the room. Yep. That's my advice to you. Always be the dumbest person in the room. So Absolutely. and usually I am. So so <laughs> I uh so I like being around really, really smart people. All right, and then Surly Dev, yep, uh, Steve usually streams on Fridays. Um, and Surly Dev's dropping all the links, so I don't have to do any of the work. Yeah, thank but, you, Surly Dev. So, um, 
but thank you everyone for hanging out with us today. Thank you, Woody, for hanging out with us. Um, I love it. I love a good EF talk. And this was a really good EF talk. Like I've seen EF talk. This is probably like my top top three EF talks. Wow. Seen. Thank you. I'm honored. Um, so high praise. Colin, from a guy who said he mostly uses Dapper. Dapper. So. I, yeah. So I love me some. But I use Dapper. I mean, in that API project, I have interchangeable Dapper, EF Core, and I even do something where I do data sets that return JSON directly from the from the uh, database, which isn't that performant, but it's kind of yeah. cool to do. So I have clients that will use any framework uh, or DB context just to manage the database lifecycle and then do Dapper directly off the database connection. Yeah, there's lots of good hybrid. Yeah, there's lots of good hybrid. Like if you need a really fast query, throw in Dapper mm -hmm. for everything else. You can you can use EF Core to get all the cool features that I showed you. I've combined Dapper with a tool called SQL Kata to get some of the query building that you get Ooh, with. That's cool. nice. Yeah. That's cool too. That's cool too. So all right. Yep. Well, that is Chris, my thank Twitter you again. Handle. Thanks, Surly Dev. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Sorry. everyone. We're going to cut the stream, but we'll see you all again next time.